a to, to keep track of questions. Um, I'll also keep an eye on the chat, but would prefer to see all questions in um, in the chat. Or, sorry, in the Q and A. Um, thank you. I'll pass it off to Adam. Adam, I think we're, we're still having an issue with your uh, uh, assignment here. I'm going to start and then we'll um, try on the back end to figure some stuff out. Um, one second. So let me bring up my presentation here. Okay, so uh, welcome again, everyone. Um, this is the uh, Chicago Works Community Challenge uh, meeting for the North uh, Planning Region. Um, to review, the, the Chicago Works Community Challenge is a $10 million community investment initiative um, that uh, came out of the two year anniversary of Mayor uh, Lightfoot's um, administration. Um, we are looking at funding um, up to $10 million in public infrastructure improvements. Um, and each project can get up to $1.5 million in funding for each of the city's seven planning districts. Um, our targeted project areas are uh, community identified enhancements to uh, public park, uh, library, schools, or residentially zoned uh, city owned vacant lots. Um, the funding source for this initiative is coming from the Chicago Works Capital Plan. And uh, so far the selection process that has gone into this um, is part of the uh, citywide evaluative committee that was convened um, of experts from each of the sister agencies and departments who are okay. working on this. And uh, we are, we they reviewed basically each of the project submissions that have come in so far based on project viability, um, the needs of the community, the potential cost for each project, the community impact it could have, and uh, additional criteria. Um, the timeline that we're hoping to execute for this is that um, we would like to have seven funded projects be announced by the end of this year. Um, again, one in each of the planning regions. And the goal is to ensure that the projects break ground or are complete by the fourth quarter of 2022. Um, and just as a, we'll get into a little bit more about what types of projects are eligible, but um, again, this is a, an infrastructure uh, initiative. Um, so the, the timeline for this project, um, we launched our applications uh, on June 1st of this year. Uh, we had um, on June 9th uh, an, a public webinar for anyone who may be interested in um, applying for this um, challenge. Um, over the summer, we convened our team of experts to be part of the evaluation committee uh, for each of the applications. And then our application deadline was August 30th. So since then, um, we have been uh, screening all of the applications that have come in and uh, members of our evaluation teams um, scored each of them based on some criteria that we'll share down uh, in the next few slides. Um, we selected our finalist presentations uh, of just a few weeks ago. Um, we announced them on October 14th. And here we are right now in this community engagement phase where we're um, holding public meetings for each of the planning regions. And uh, there will be presentations by each of the semi-finalist teams so that you can see uh, what their ideas are. Our last community meeting will be on November 9th. And then from November through December, uh, we will be uh, evaluating each of the um, applications again to uh, decide on a finalist. Um, and so then we're hoping by the end of the year to make that announcement. Um, so, over 500 uh, applications were received for this. Of those 500, 
about 239 were uh, deemed to be complete enough to move on to the next phase of this process. Um, we had 48 out of the 50 wards represented uh, from in all of these applications. Vacant lot projects and park submissions were the top two uh, categories that we saw applications for. Uh, and then by planning region, we actually saw the most applications come in for the Southeast, then followed by the West region, far South, North, Northwest, Central and Southwest. Uh, some of the funding eligibility requirements are each of these projects are, again, for infrastructure projects. Uh, so these are what we call brick and mortar expenses. A good example of that would be playground equipment, park path re uh, replacements, field house improvements, and library space modernizations. Ineligible costs are related to anything that's specific to programming or equipment-based expenses. Some examples of that could be computers or furniture or decorative plants. There is, you know, when we talk about programming that kind of goes into staffing needs. Um, you know, if you wanted to have some type of curriculum or something, none of that would be applicable to uh, this funding source. So each of the reviewing uh, members of our evaluation committee they scored all of the projects based on different classifications. So the first one was, is this property within the purview of the department or agency and the community uh, Chicago Works Challenge or Chicago Works Community Challenge program, yes or no? Is this project financially feasible? So could it be completed within the budget of up to $1.5 million? Does this project propose capital improvements that are bond eligible? Will this development, is it actually feasible? Are there significant barriers to this development uh, on, on these sites? Is the design feasible? Can a project be completed at this site that meets our design excellence goals? Operationally, is this project feasible? So that gets down into staffing and, and maintenance of the site. Would this project as described be manageable to maintain from an ongoing operational standpoint? And then qualitative comments. Um, overall, is this project something that would be a strong addition to your department or agency's 2022 pipeline? Other members of our evaluation committee were part of the mayor's office and they were scoring kind of on a, a broader look at how well each of these projects engaged with the community. So we have, you know, was this application complete? Did they provide, you know, a thorough kind of docu well-documented project? Did they solicit community input? Uh, did they have, you know, good feedback that this was something that would be valuable to the community? Would this project potentially activate the neighborhood um, could they make a compelling state, a case that this would be a good space that could lead to broader neighborhood activation? And is this a public use project? Did the applicant make a compelling case that the project would be heavily utilized by the public? So would it get a lot of foot traffic? The three finalists for uh, the, or semi-finalists for the North District include two parks projects and a school um, playground project. We have uh, a project from Nettlehurst Elementary, um, from the Leon Beach Park, and from Warren Park. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to invite each of the project finalists onto uh, this side of the, the Zoom webinar. So we're going to um, have, if you're part of the Nettlehurst project, if you could raise your hand and we'll promote you to a panelist so that you can join this uh, initiative. Uh, and this would be just if you're if you're part of the crew that you know made the application itself, um, please let us know. Second.
Hi, Colleen. Uh, do, do you have a number of additional? Uh, should we bring all of these folks in? Uh, sure. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Few more here. While we're doing that, I see a couple of questions popping up in the chat around other regions and why there aren't finalists from other regions. This is just for North. So there was a community meeting for each of the seven regions. We're only looking at the final semifinalists in the North region today. There are three semifinalists in every region of the city, just, just for y'all's awareness. Uh, great. And sorry, there's a, a number that are I'm trying to uh, pull in here. Um, uh, if, can you lower your hands if you're not going to be part of this panel? <laughs> Or I'll I'll lower all the hands and then we can uh, please if you're just the the ones that will be speaking um, on behalf of this project. Great. Looks like you had a lot of enthusiastic folks <laughs> who were there. Okay, is this the uh, the team that will be speaking? It Great. is. All right, so um, you are please uh, take the floor. Okay, thank you. May I share my screen, Gabby? Okay, hopefully I can please bear with me here. <laughs> um, hmm. It looks like you should if you, the green button at the bottom. Okay. Um. And I, I apologize for this. It's okay, we've had a number of Zoom okay. gremlins today, so. <laughs> oh, can you see? No, not yet. Oh dear. No, oh, I see me. No. Oh. Oh dear. Uh, Asima, would you be able to share your screen and I could talk possibly? Yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me bring up the, the slides. On the Thank you. Yeah, let me try to do that real quick. Uh, okay. Go ahead Thank and get you. started. Okay. <laughs> I, I honestly had the slides at like 5.59 and then. <laughs> well, thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Colleen McLean and I am uh, president of the Nettlehurst Parent Teacher Organization. Tonight, I will be presenting the Nettlehurst Playground Renewal Project on behalf of the MPTO in Nettlehurst Elementary School. Thank you for this opportunity. It is an honor to be considered amongst the other great projects in the North City region for the Chicago Works Community Challenge Grant. I would also like to take a minute and recognize the enormous amount of support here with me tonight. Um, I am grateful to be joined by the Nettlehurst Administration, Principal Muhammad, Assistant Principal Williams, the Nettlehurst Local School Council, represented by Susan there, and um, Nettlehurst teachers and staff, Nettlehurst parents, representatives from Alderman Tunney's office, State Representative Margaret Croak, State, Rep State Senator now Sarah Feigenholtz, the Lakeview East Chamber of Commerce, and the Lakeview East community members. Nettlehurst is the neighborhood elementary school for the Lakeview East community. We serve nearly 700 students in grades pre-K through eight, and our families speak more than 40 languages. In addition, 20% of our students come from low-income households and 10% are diverse learners. The story of the Nettlehurst Playground Renewal Project begins with us focusing on repairing 
the broken playground soft surface. However, the Nettlehurst teachers encouraged us, encouraged us to think bigger and reassess how we welcome kids to play and how our equipment impacts the play experience for all children. From this discussion, an inclusive playground proposal was developed. Communities are diverse and inclusive and playgrounds should be too. So what are the benefits of an inclusive playground and why are we excited about it? Inclusive playgrounds ensure physical and social inclusion where everyone can play together. It allows children of all ages and abilities to develop independence and feel included while contributing to a mean meaningful play experience. Inclusive playgrounds promote understanding, reduce prejudices, and support social integration. The benefits are more than just the environment of play. It's also about what happens once a child gets there. Inclusive playgrounds promote a healthy and active lifestyle for all children and families. Playgrounds allow for children to make health choices while cooperating with their peers in a positive way. According to the 2021 State of Childhood Obesity Report released just two weeks ago, the national obesity rate for children ages two through 19 jumped from 19% in 2019 to 22% in 2020, in part due to the increase in sedentary lifestyle during the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, according to the CDC, children with disabilities are at a greater risk of obesity. Regardless of a child's abilities, it is important that every child and student find a way to be active and exercise confidently. But the impact and benefit of the Nettlehurst Playground Renewal Project extends far beyond the Nettlehurst students. Located on the corners of Broadway and Melrose Street, the Nettlehurst Playground serve as a town square for the Lakeview East community. The Lakeview East community knows and uses the Nettlehurst Playgrounds every day and their adjacent open spaces are lively and multifunctional with seasonal markets, sports teams, and leagues, Christmas tree sales, and informal meetups. Playgrounds allow for adult social interaction, incorporating the whole community and allowing for individuals from different backgrounds to come together and gather. A neighborhood playground provides an opportunity to meet your neighbors and further fosters a sense of camaraderie with other community members. In addition to promoting a healthy lifestyle for children and adults, vibrant playgrounds also have positive economic impacts. Playgrounds promote greater foot traffic to local businesses. Also, studies have demonstrated that living near a well-maintained playground can boost property values. Additionally, several studies have reported a decrease in crime rates when neighborhoods have functional and inclusive playgrounds. In conclusion, the Nettlehurst Playground Renewal, with its emphasis on inclusivity to promote engagement of both children and adults of all abilities, will be a highly visible public demonstration of Chicago's commitment to children of all ages and ability and the greater Lakeview East community. We wholeheartedly believe that our beloved town square has the potential to be even more dynamic and impactful than it already is. Thank you so much for your interest and attention this evening. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure, did you, were you able to get your slides to come up if you wanted to run through those quickly? Um, I do have some slides if I'm able to share them. Let's see. Where would I? Let's... There should be a little green button right at the bottom of the screen. Oh, here screen. we go. Yep. One sec. Okay. Can everyone see that? I'm just gonna go through this real quickly just so I don't take up too much time. So 
this is a view just of the larger back playground and you and everyone can kind of see the I mean this is kind of it for the structures and then you can see some of the damage there and just some of the wear and tear this next picture is it, you can really see some of the the damage and just the the repairs that are needed for that playground so you you can there there are obviously trip hazards and and just to Colleen's point this isn't a very inclusive playground as is. And so our goal is to really make it inclusive and to make it something where kids of all different walks of life can come and play and not be restricted to just not using this equipment. So, and then here you, we just kind of have some close up shots and then we've included just a rendering here of just what we envision the playground could look like. And you can see it's just a little more dynamic. It's it's a little more, it's more fun. It's got more options. It's not just slides and, and whatnot. So that's that's another rendering there. And then this is a view just from further back where you can see all of it. And here we just have a picture of just, this is really showing the town square idea. And, and it's not just a playground, it really is a place where our community on the north side, especially East Lakeview, we convene. We have the Christmas tree market. We've got our Halloween festivities. We've got the farmer's market. We go there on the weekends. It's a place where parents can come and congregate while their kids are playing. And, you know, personally, I've made friends on that playground. I've, I've made connections. And so it's, it's much more than just a playground. So I, we can take questions or if, if anyone has them, but that's the extent of it. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, um, thank you. Leah, did we have any questions come through? So as of right now, I don't see any questions specific to, um, to the Nettle Horse Playground. I'll, I'll give people another minute. Um, Adam, oh, there's one question that popped up. Can you speak to how it is more inclusive than the existing structure of the new proposal? Hi, yes. Um, the When you look at inclusivity, you have to think of children. Uh, disabilities come in many forms or the physical disabilities that of course you can see. So um, inclusive playgrounds allow for people in wheelchair. I'm just giving a very basic example. Um, allow for uh, children in wheelchairs to be able to come right up to the play equipment. They don't have to go up steps to a slide or climb a rope ladder. Um, another example is uh, some children have uh, uh, disabilities uh, that involve sensory, um, sensory issues. And so the new inclusive playground would have more sensory features as well. So those are two, I mean, I could keep going on and give more and more examples about inclusiveness, um, but we just don't have time for that. So those are two very uh, obvious and basic examples. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, there is another question around if you all have tried to raise funding in the past for this project. Uh, no, we haven't. We have just recently started looking at repairing the, um, the holes in the soft surface. Um, and as I mentioned in uh, my presentation earlier, that the teacher said, hey, wait a minute, look around at the equipment. It's not just the holes. How are we, what if, are we making sure every child has a chance to play? That sounds great. There's another question that popped up um, that might not be for the team, but it's around when this would happen. Um, so this is something that the city would get. The, so the funding would be deployed by the city. CPS would go in and fix the playground and we expect all projects to be completed um, if awarded by 2022. So that, that happens according to the CPS timeline. It, it does. And it and I believe in administration where work hand in hand with CPS and more than likely projects like this are done during the summer when there's no, no immediate need for the playground. I think that's, there are a couple questions around like the, the final design. Um, and, and so 
a lot of the details around timeline and final design will be ironed out if the project is awarded, again, in coordination with uh, the administration and with CPS. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to emphasize for this process is that, you know, this is going to be a collaborative process, um, you know, for any of the projects, if they're selected, they would be working very closely with the sister agencies. So Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Park District, um, or the libraries to actually get this pl plan into a, a good place where it can move forward. All of the hiring of designers and <coughs> architects and, and that type of thing would be handled by um, Chicago Public Schools. So basically the, the money that is going to be awarded will be going directly to CPS and then they'll be working out the project details or, you know, if this, or the park district or, you know, the Chicago, we don't have any library projects here, but um, whatever that project would be. Um, yeah, there are also a couple questions along the vein of, of CPS around um, why, whether this is, falls under regular CPS maintenance um, and kind of a distinction between that and the funding for this opportunity. I think for all of these projects, libraries, parks, vacant lots, and schools, these proposals um, are transformation beyond regular maintenance. So those agencies are maintaining these facilities, but what, what's proposed here is, is beyond the scope of maintaining the equipment. It would be something new. I don't know, Gabby or, or Adam, if you have something to share on that as well. Yeah, one other thing I'd clarify for that is that no funding is switching hands. So this is just a mechanism for the city to allocate its funding within these departments based on community-driven ideas and input. So C CPS, this is part of CPS's budget and they would just allocate one up to $1.5 million um, to renovate this playground. So the, the term grant might be a bit, bit of a misnomer. It's more about making sure that departments are spending their money and allocating their budgets um, according to community-driven um, responses. Great. Well, thank you so much to the Nella Horse team. We're very happy to have you here. And um, I'm going to send you back into the regular part of the webinar uh, in a second. And then uh, we'll move on to uh, our next project. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, great, so I'm going to go back to my screen for a second here. Um, oop, let's jump too far ahead. So um, just to recap, this was the Nettlehurst project at 3252 North Broadway. Um, the sponsoring organization was the parent teacher uh, organization. And, you know, they discussed more details about uh, what their project is, is looking to do. Um, so the, the next team that we're going to invite up are the uh, Sam Leone Beach Park Nature Center construction. So if those uh, folks would raise their hands who are working specifically on this submission, then we can bring you into the webinar. Let three of you, one second. One more. I'm just going to share my screen one second again really quickly here so I can review this uh, slide. So uh, is it the Leon or Leone? <laughs> yeah, it's Leon. Leon. Okay, good. <laughs> I was doubting myself for a second. Uh, Leon Beach Park Fieldhouse um, is at uh, 1222 West Tui Avenue. Um, the sponsoring organization is Leon Beach Park Advisory Council. Um, and, you know, they're interested in uh, enhancements to make the space ADA compliant, uh, another a number of infrastructure improvements such as air conditioning uh, and other things that are in need of repair. Um, and they will um, go into some more details for you right now. 
Um, so please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, my name is Ann Whalen and I'm the uh, president of the Leon Park P Advisory Council. And um, I want to thank the group for the city and the park district and all for uh, bringing us to the semi-finalist position. Um, and we really appreciate the support of the older woman, Maria Haddon, and all of the community who actually brought this project forward. Um, this neighborhood for several years has participated with what's called participatory budgeting. And this project first came up in that process. And uh, so the community for a long time has been interested this building that you see in the in the slide is and it's, it's the oldest building on Chicago's lakefront. It is not open to the public. Um, it is not open at all nine months of the year and it's not open at all to the public. So our goal is to open it up so that the community can benefit. Um, we have a sister park, Loyola Park, that is adjacent. And so we are we sit right on Lake Michigan and not only um, is it a resource that the community can't use, but it, it has this ability to be, um, to connect to Lake Michigan and to bring people into the lake, uh, to be able to appreciate the lake and to um, involve everyone in um, the restored environment. You can see some of the, in the photos we've uh, planted around the building and a native area. And we also have, I have um, involved with, uh, are expecting to uh, uh, install nature play uh, adjacent to in the, in the playground adjacent. So we have a number of natural, um, um, natural areas around it. And it would be great to open up this building to the to the neighborhood, to the region, the North region, and to Chicago and Chicago land, so that people can come and experience the lake in a, a very accessible way to all ages, because this does sit right on the lake and you can get right up to it. So AJ here is going to go through a few more slides so you can and talk a little bit about each of those uh, projects, and then we will welcome your questions. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Hi, everybody. Uh, many of you, and even some of you in Rogers Park may be wondering, like, where is Leon Beach? Um, let's see. Sorry, it's not advancing my slides. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so Leon Beach is in Rogers Park, right where Tui meets the lake. And as Ian referenced, we sit right on top of Loyola Park, but our three acres in and of ourselves and are easily accessible, um, basically however you need to get to us. So if you're in Rogers Park, you can walk to us from anywhere, um, but also CTA, Metra, buses, uh, we even have Divi bike stations. We have a parking lot adjacent to the building. Um, if you have a kayak or canoe, great, head our way. We have a boat launch right there at the beach. And um, you can see within the circle here, the building that we're talking about. So let's, sorry, my slides are a little slow to move. There we go. Um, so yeah, this is it. You've seen the um, picture once before. This is the current field house, as Anne said, um, you know, the oldest structure on Chicago's lakefront. And our proposal is to transform this building into a space, a multi-purpose space serving everyone in the community. Um, that will mean some, you know, pretty big upgrades, some pretty important changes, um, such as ADA compliance. So not every floor is level in this space. Um, we want it to be year round accessible. Um, so that involves heating and cooling. Uh, we also want to preserve the structure. That's a big part of the value of this building. And so um, some work to make sure it's structurally sound, as well as, you know, you can see here from this picture, there are a number of windows um, that are closed up. 
Uh, we want to open them back up and really connect this space to the surrounding natural areas. Um, and, you know, you'll also see from a few other pictures, it's kind of hard to tell how you would even get into this building to begin with. Um, you can see here in the floor plan too, that it's actually a lot bigger space than it looks. There's a lot of rooms, a lot of rooms of different sizes. Um, unfortunately, they don't all easily connect to one another. So that's another piece of the accessibility that we'd like to address. Um, but you can see here in this floor plan, the enormous amount of potential for multi-uses that this building has, um, much more than certainly, um, you know, sitting unused for, for nine months out of the year. And this is um, a few more of the spaces that you can see. Um, again, you know, currently being unused, a few more windows here that you can see that have just been boarded up. Um, and so we would just encourage you to, to look at these spaces and the potential that they hold um, for a number of things, classrooms, uh, meeting rooms, event spaces, art spaces, um, you know, all of these things are, are possible if we just, uh, you know, take a, a bit better care of this building um, and especially, you know, getting it, getting these windows back open. Whoop. Thanks for your patience with the, the frenetic slide changing. Okay, so, um, you know, as Gabriella mentioned, um, this nature center is a long held goal of the Leon Beach Park Advisory Council. And it's part of our ongoing work, almost a decade long work um, to connect the community with the incredible ecologies that are right in our backyard in Rogers Park. Um, and touched on this, you know, all around the building in front, there's a sand prairie. In the back, there's a black oak savanna um, that now wraps around um, because of the pack and the plantings we've done. Um, we're in the process of facilitating a nature play area in the adjacent playground for children. Um, and we've secured funding for a green parking lot that will better serve the natural areas um, and the building itself. So um, the pack has already wrapped around this building some really um, successful, um, important ecological projects that are engaging the community. Um, we are also already doing um, some of the things we would wanna fill this building with. So educational programming, we recently held a program about uh, lake levels that had over 160 people attend. Uh, we have nature walks, tree walks, bird walks that regularly um, see a good turnout, 60 plus people. Um, and then we have you know, natural area work days. That's how I found the pack. That's how many of us have found the pack is just showing up and being part of caring for um, these places. And, um, you know, people are also coming from the community's schools and organizations to learn about what it is, you know, we're doing um, in this area. So you'll see in the bottom picture here, um, this is a planting in the Black Oak Savannah. And then you see a picture um, of a different part of the Savannah above um, during, during one of the bird walks. And I'm happy to say um, that it's not just the pack that would like this uh, change to come to Rogers Park. And we know because we asked. Um, we asked this summer and we had over 160 people respond. 98% um, of those people live in Rogers Park or a nearby neighborhood. Um, and over 90% said um, that they would use a nature center specifically at Leon Beach. That's what we asked them. And uh, we had an emphatic response, um, especially when it came to educational programming, arts and culture um, displays for uh, folks of all ages. Um, and um, yeah, we're also thrilled, uh, as Anne mentioned, to have the support of Alder Woman Haddon, um, who shared um, this lovely quote below and who's with us tonight about the value of um, bringing this nature center as an opportunity uh, for uh, you know, conservation, resiliency, sustainability. Um, and, you know, this, there's just clearly um, energy from 
the pack from the community from community leadership to see this um, change to see this uh, historic building better serve the surrounding community um, so I want to again um, thank you know the city's team but I also want to thank our community members who are here tonight and who have supported uh, the PAC's work for a long time so we're grateful to you and we welcome everyone's questions Great, thank you so much. Um, so I think we are ready to go to questions. Leo, did you see if there were any came in specifically? Yep, um, I'm just looking through. I don't think there are any specific, oh, here we go. Um, who would run the year round programming at the Nature Center? or are there, are there current proposals to do so? Uh, the building is currently closed, so there are, it's, there's no staff right there. So that would have to be a discussion with the park district. Okay. Um, that looks like the one. And I, I will say that as volunteers, the advisory council, we do, we do run programs. Before the pandemic, we were running them monthly. And this year we had, we've had four even with the pandemic, so. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just double checking between the, the chat and the... Um, there is a, a question around the Loyola Fieldhouse being nearby and having similar offerings. It does sound like there's enough community support for both buildings, so I'm... Um, not well, sure I, if, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I can answer that because I actually am a, a member of the Loyola PAC. Um, they, that building has um, a couple of basketball courts and some meeting rooms, but really they are very limited. And so by opening this up for nature, you have, you have the ability to really um, provide both things that you don't have to choose between sports and um, more passive recreation. So it, rather than this building set sitting empty, it wouldn't really be in competition. It would just be an addition. Um, and if I can just jump back to the other question for a second, because someone put in the chat, you know, that many educators and naturalists might also be willing to volunteer. And I will say since the survey, we have had an emphatic response from area ecologists, teachers, parents, um, who have really become like energized around this idea. Um, and so I, I just want to hold up that comment. I think that's right. We're, we're seeing a response um, from the community and Rogers Park is full of incredible talent and engaged people. Um, there's a question about who would maintain the building. I think that would be the community along with the uh, parks department as that's they right. maintain other properties. Um, There are a few questions around other aspects like geothermal heating and cooling. And I'll just say addition, we're just focused on the proposals at hand, um, not kind of looking beyond the scope. We've determined uh, experts at parks and within our budget office have determined that these projects fit within the scope of that 1.5 million. So I think, I think any additions to any of these projects are sort of beyond that, that scope. Um, Adam, Gabby, I don't know if you have other thoughts on that. I yeah, I would just tie it back to the slide that Gabby showed about permissible uses of the up to $1.5 million in funding. So it has to be on infrastructure. So this proposal is really rooted in, right, really rehabbing the field house and making the building look and feel different and everything that goes into that. Any additional programming on top of that, like I saw someone mention kayaking in a question, um, that would have to be funded um, from a different place. It couldn't be funded through the bond the bond capital. Um, and then there are a few questions around whether this would be a stop on the Lake Michigan Canoe Trail. I don't know if you all know that, I'm not familiar with. It, 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 it already is a stop on the, on the Lake Michigan Water Trail. And right now there's a sign about this large that announces it. So it is in fact the, the goal of the pack. I don't know that it would be part of this project, but it's the goal of the pack to enhance the um, the, no, the uh, connection to the 
to the lake, not only visually, but by um, it, there is a, a kayak and canoe launch right there. And the last yeah. question that's come up a few times is, um, what, it, what is it used for the three months of the year that it is operational? I, in the summer, uh, the life, it's a lifeguard station. <clears throat> and also they run the junior guard program. One of the historic parts of this, of this park is Sam Leone, after whom the park is named, is the in, creator of a, of a junior guard program where uh, for decades, um, all the lifeguards learned how to, their lifeguarding skills at Leon Park. Now that program has been um, socialized, it, it exists now in many other parks, but um, they have a, a day camp essentially for junior lifeguards. Great, I don't think there are too many others. Adam, I don't know if you noticed any other questions pop up. But that can be addressed by the team. I, I think for, you know, the interest of time, I think we'll move on. And, um, you know, we, so I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, after this session, we will be sending out um, a survey of tomorrow morning that any of the attendees um, can uh, contribute, add their ideas, their comments. Um, we'll get into a little bit more details about the survey at the end of this webinar. Um, and then um, we also, the recording of this is now streaming live on YouTube, so uh, you can also share it with others uh, in your community who may not have been able to attend tonight so that they can learn about these programs as well. Um, so thank you so much um, to the, this uh, great team. Um, I'm going to send you back to the webinar and then we'll move on to uh, our final presentation. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Second. Great. Okay, and um, I'm just gonna go back to my slides quickly here to set up the next presentation. Um, so our final presentation is for um, a Warren Park multi-generational sport improvement plan. Uh, the property is Warren Park at 6601 Northwestern Avenue. The sponsoring organization is the Warren Park Advisory Council. The areas uh, for improvement are the sports area needs to be modernized with enhanced accessibility options. And then some additional details were um, this project would tear down the broken batting cages, which are unusable and create uh, one, a multi-purpose volleyball court area, and two, use the vacant area behind the batting cages for a cricket practice area. Uh, a nature play space would also be created with access for people in wheelchairs and strollers. Um, so I'm gonna stop this slide. So the, if the Warren Park team, if you could raise your hands and we'll invite you into uh, the, the panelist. Second. Great. Hello. Here we go. Um, Jeff, are you also there? I am here. Hi, Great. everybody. Hello. Um, so please, uh, your team has the floor. Great. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, thank you for giving us the, this opportunity to present. Um, and I'd like to give a thank you and a shout out to all our supporters who are here tonight. Um, this proposal has the full support of Alderman Silverstein, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. Um, what we wanted to do with this proposal was to um, create, a, to reanimate spaces in Warren Park that weren't being used and to make these spaces usable for populations that, you know, for individuals that wouldn't otherwise be using them. 
Um, so for a little bit of background, Warren Park is located in West Ridge. It's 90 acres, uh, half of which is the Robert A. Black Golf Course. It has a uh, outdoor ice rink, baseball diamonds, pickleball, tennis courts, soccer field, football, cricket field, uh, and is home for various Chicago public school indoor and outdoor leagues. Um, it's a very big, big park. Our programs have included a lot of youth sports. Uh, we have an early childhood program. We have senior fitness and a tremendous pickleball program. Um, we have a wheelchair basketball tournament for both youth and adults for the last eight years, preschool programs. Uh, we serve uh, from 18 months to 17 years old. Um, it's a very busy, busy park. Uh, with COVID restrictions, we definitely had to scale back. Uh, we only served uh, approximately 660 kids this year. Our first improvement was to put in a nature play space. Um, the process to do it was already and started before the announcement of the Chicago Works Community Challenge. The paperwork was submitted. Um, and earlier this year, we received from approval for the location to be at the southwest corner of the park. Um, what you're seeing here is Western Avenue. Um, we wanted to build it around the hill because hills are, I, as I understand it from Sean Schaefer, highly sought after um, in terms of play and, and the kids using them. Um, and so we're building it around there. And because it's close to the play lot here, and the restrooms. Um, early, the early childhood asset map in 2019 showed West Ridge has uh, 6,751 children under the age of five. And we wanted to create a place where parents can bring their kids, inspire their curiosity, engage their senses. You know, something that allows creative play, you know, growth and discovery in a natural setting. Um, nature play spaces are um, being put in many of the parks. Uh, in 2020, Sean was working with 12 parks uh, to get a nature play space in them. Um, here's the other view. You're looking from the other side. Um, this is along the tennis courts and around here so you can access to the play lot. Along here, we want to make this wheelchair accessible. Um, we really want to focus on kids being able to get in here and parents not having to worry about a wheelchair and negotiating you know, the terrain. So we wanted to put a, a, a sidewalk in through here. Um, this is the view from the hill looking down. And um, we want to create a, you know, a nature play center, wheelchair acts accessible. And so, you know, we can bring more children into the park. Our next improvement is the cricket field. Um, cricket began in Warren Park in 2014. The season runs from April to October. Uh, cricket is, it's north of the field house. And we want to take advantage of the continued growth of the game in the U.S. Uh, they currently enjoy about 20 million fans. The Major League Cricket Organization, which is like the NFL for cricket, is going to be rolling out six teams in about the next year and a half, you know, just to roll it out. Uh, it enjoys a lot of popularity. Um, and because of the diverse neighborhood that we live in, we want to have we want to improve the playing field and the surrounding area. Our teams uh, come from India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Trinidad, and Jake, Jamaica, and many of our players live in the community. For improvements, we need to uh, level the ground. We need to uh, repair the pitch, which is the pitcher's mound. Also cutting down some trees on the north side of the, the cricket field, which impairs the ref's decision-making. Uh, we need in, in to install lights for night games, and we want to create a warm-up practice area next to the proposed volleyball courts. So here's where you see the cricket field. This is what's called the pitch. This is where they, they pitch the balls to the, uh, the hitters. And in the background, 
is this area that is not used, it's fenced off, nobody uses it, and we'd like to take that over for the cricket players. This is a better shot of it. It's right next to the batting cages. And it's right here, and we'd like to use that for them. And you can see in there, there's a there's a pitch in there now, you know, that they use sometimes. Um, but we definitely feel that it warrants the improvements and the interest in the area and the interest in the game. Um, a lot of people don't know cricket was played in the U.S. Uh, in the 1800s. There were 22 states where the game was played. So it's enjoying a resurgence and we'd like to be able to have night games and to open this up to the community. Um, the next improvement is the batting cages. Um, unfortunately, with weather, time, budget, they have fallen into disrepair and have not been usable for years. And they're right on Western Avenue, they're an eyesore and it's basically a valuable waste of space. So we'd like to tear them down and we'd like to install volleyball courts, which can also be used as pickleball courts. So here's the long shot of it. And this is the area we'd like to take over for the cricket people. And this is a close up of it. Now it's, it's, it hasn't been used since the early 2000s. Um, you know, we just, it's, it's taking up valuable real estate and we'd like to get rid of it. The other one, which was not listed on the initial uh, slide, uh, but was in our proposal was, we want to improve our horseshoe shuffleboard bocce ball area. Um, we want to renovate them. They're in bad shape, dilapidated wood. Uh, the ground is uneven. Um, and we'd like to include, you know, new courts, new um, borders, and the shuffleboard needs to be repainted. Here is where the, the bocce ball would go in. Um, wide open space, put in new courts, level the ground, mark it off better. And over here is our horseshoe area. And it's in pretty sad shape. Um, so we'd like to level the ground, redo the borders, improve the pitch, the um, pitching area here. And what I'd like to stress to people is what we want to do in this community, because it's so diverse, is we want to create opportunities for people to come into it as individuals. We have no shortage of team sports in Warren Park, but we want to make it accessible and available. We want wheelchair access. Um, I think it's important that we look at other segments of the population that have not been given a place in the park. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff uh, for closing remarks. Thank you, Pam. So our primary objective and theme on our creation of these uh, changes is to create areas in the park for versatile play for multi-generational uh, par uh, participants. West Ridge, is, as we many of us know, is one of the, the most diverse areas in Chicago. And in summary, what we envision is to create a three-season uh, three seasons of low to moderate outdoor recreational activity for families and groups to enjoy together. Seniors through the young toddlers participating in things all together. Uh, shuffleboard, bocce ball, and the, um, the horseshoe area really offers modification for distances to targets. You can set children up the same way you can adults encouraging play and rewarding their outcomes. This, you know, promoting inclusion and fun for all ages. Uh, of course, we wanna have access for wheelchairs and mobility for each of those areas. Uh, pickleball, pickleball offers a much smaller area for play than tennis. For skill building, there's a lot less running and chasing down a ball. Uh, volleyball, where we've all experienced picnic gatherings where, with a variety of age groups uh, participating in those games. 
opportunities for a variety of net heights. We'd like um, this to be very versatile and setting which uh, setting these heights to provide encouragement for all ages and all levels of play. Uh, as Pam mentioned, the cricket field, the cricket field, a broad, it's a broad population in our community and across the country are acquire, acquiring a fascination for this game. Uh, exposure and popularity of this game is growing enormously. And um, we'd like to offer coaches and players to mentor new generations in this ever growing age old game. Uh, the nature play space has been talked about quite a bit at the park. A um, lot of excitement around it. We'd like to provide toddlers and young children the creative space for play, growth, and discovery. Um, we think that all these park enhancements will provide parents, grandparents to engage with kids in low impact activities of balance and agility without having to climb into the small, up the small staircases and fitting through those small slides. And with that, I just wanna to close to thank Warren, the Warren Park Advisory Council wishes to thank Mayor Lightfoot, the Department of Planning and Development for the opportunity to present our vision today of uh, the park improvements and greatly appreciate the consideration for acceptance in this challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll move over to questions. Uh, Leah, you wanna let us know? Yeah, absolutely. So there was one question about um, what would happen to the soccer fields. The soccer field, the soccer field would stay as is. I mean, that's over, they're used, they use the fields that are over by to the north of the batting cages. And that the cricket field is the field directly north of the field house. Great, thank you. Um, and th there were a couple of comments and questions around um, options to, to do this without tearing down trees, concerns about flooding. I would say if you have any specific concerns or requests with regard to the proposal um, the to trees. outline those in the survey, that's something that the Parks Department can look at if this project is awarded and, and rely on to help address some of the concerns, particularly something like flooding, if that's a, a, a concern, um, parks can take that into account as they are building out this space. And also that's why we wanna level the cricket field because you do have those dips and you do see those, those patches of water in that. The trees to be cut down are just those five trees next to the cage where we wanna put the practice cricket area. Um, but again, you know, the Chicago Park District will make the final decision on that if we're awarded. And just to be clear on the, on the trees, as much as I love trees myself and gardening and so on, I want to make a point that these trees are less than, I want to say certainly less than a five diameter trees. They're not the larger trees. Gratefully, some of the beauties out in a different field don't need to be touched in any way. Uh, it's just just um, just in one area. That sounds good, thank you. Um, I think that's it on specific questions. There are a few questions that I think are applicable overall for all the groups. So I don't know, Gabby, we can send um, send our presenters back and address some of those. Fill out your surveys. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll uh, send you back and then we'll wrap thank up you, with everyone. a few more comments. Um, yeah, so one of the first general questions are is about whether or not um, multiple projects will be funded in a community area that has um, more of an infrastructure need than the north side, potentially, given that north had fewer applications. I don't know, Adam, do you want to um, address that? Yeah, sure. So we're going to be having one awarded project in each of the city's seven planning regions, so one in each. We have great semi-finalist projects in each of the regions. And when Mayor Lightfoot launched this um, two-year anniversary, $10 million challenge, it really was to have projects funded and going up all across the city. So it's going to be one awarded finalist per region. But what I would say is, and I've seen a few comments like this in the comment section, that these are all really great projects. And we couldn't agree more. You know, all 21 of the semi-finalists across the seven regions show really, really thoughtful community input um show a real need 
um, we're at the correct scale for this type of project or funding source as well. So what we'd say to that is this doesn't necessarily have to be a zero sum game. Only one project in each region is going to get the award through this challenge. But all of these projects have been heavily vetted by the relevant departments. So Parks looked at these projects and we was excited about all of them. And all of them are going to become part of the investment roadmap for these departments in the years to come. You know, that isn't a commitment to say these are all going to be funded in the next year or two or three, but more so to say that all of these semifinalists have gotten great exposure um, to the city and city departments who have now seen the need brought forward by the community. So the hope is that these will now all become part of the broader investment roadmap for the city, even if they're not each funded specifically through um, the community challenge. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, another question that came up was if access to other potential funding and diversity of the community are decision factors for the award. Gabby, um, if you don't mind taking that one. Um, you know, I think that we have criteria that's kind of been developed at this point, but what we're going to be looking at is, you know, responses uh, to the surveys that are will be going out uh, tomorrow morning. You could actually access it tonight if you also go to chicago.gov slash Chicago Works Challenge. There's a link there, but uh, tomorrow morning we'll also send a reminder email with all of the information um, from tonight's meeting as well. Um, so, you know, please, you know, give us your feedback, um, what, what you think uh, for each of those. And, you know, I think it's going to kind of depend on, on the reactions that we're seeing uh, from each of these community areas. Um, but the final decisions will be made by um, our uh, evaluation team, which is truly composed of experts um, from the Park District, the Chicago Public Schools, uh, Chicago Libraries, Department of Planning and Development. We also are working with our um, regional planner leads who um, you know, have input into this conversation as well, as well. Um, in addition to folks from the, the mayor's office who um, work in community engagement regularly. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, again, another question about how we can show support. I, I'll, I'll go back to, to what Gabby just said. Those surveys are the best way to illustrate your support for a given project. I think that should be it. I see a lot of great support and comments in the chat, so we appreciate that. And please, the, the survey link is also um, in, in the chat as well. Um, so just going back to our uh, presentation here. So the next step uh, is of course that we really want your input as part of the final step of the selection process. Um, the survey will be sent out uh, tomorrow morning, or you can go to the website today and add your comments. Um, the survey will ask for direct input on, uh, on the following scoring criteria. So would the project lead to greater community activation? Um, community activation is kind of broadly, will this um, space be a kind of a catalytic project for your neighborhood, for, for this region, you know, will it um, help kind of broadly improve, um, you know, the, the quality of life in that area? And then second to that is, would this project be heavily utilized? So the other side to that is, um, you know, will we see significant foot traffic into this type of investment? Um, the survey also leaves space for uh, additional comments. Um, which we will uh, welcome as well. Um, and so then just to recap, there were a few extra pictures uh, from Nettlehorst. Here is a kind of more zoomed in image of an idea that they put forth. Um, again, none of these designs are, are final. Um, that would still need to go through um, a, a, a long process with Chicago Public Schools if, if this was selected. Um, here are some additional images of the playground as it is right now. And then uh, the Leone Beach uh, Nature Center. Uh, here's a, a little bit more of a, a picture as well. Um, and then a, a few more. I think these were also in their presentation earlier. So that is the end of our um, presentation tonight. 
really, uh, truly thank you so much for joining us. Uh, apologies again for a little delayed start. Uh, we just wanted to try to have our uh, language interpretation services available before we started the meeting. Um, and um, we are really looking forward to uh, seeing uh, community responses. So we really encourage you to also share this survey, share the video. We'll send a link to the video recording tomorrow to end, uh, you and you can pass it along to anyone in your community who wasn't able to attend. And so we can also get additional uh, input. So uh, thank you again. And uh, we're really looking forward to uh, all of your responses. Uh, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.